When you think of baseball today, you think of togetherness, America's pastime, something that people can enjoy regardless of race, religion, or class. It is played in countless countries across the globe and acts almost as a universal language. However, baseball hasn't always been this way. Consider the year 1940. Jim Crow is alive and well in the American South, and levels of racial tension and discrimination are at some of the highest they have ever been. In this time, Major League Baseball was strictly for whites. African Americans and Hispanics played together in a separate league called the Negro League. Ruling over Major League Baseball during this period as commissioner was Kennesaw Mountain Landis. Kennesaw Mountain Landis was ultimately the final opposition to integration in Major League Baseball. It was only after his death in 1945 when his segregationist ideology could no longer influence policy and baseball and the major leagues could move towards integration and ultimately progress past his racist beliefs. Nicknamed the judge because of his status as an actual U.S. federal judge, Landis was known to rule with an iron fist. Landis was also a man who is generally believed to hold racist views against African Americans, although he never explicitly stated them to the public. His racist beliefs can be seen through various actions of his. One such example many have cited as proof of Landis' prejudice is his decision in the case of black world heavyweight boxing champion Jack Johnson in 1913. Johnson was accused of bringing a white woman across state lines for, quote, immoral purposes, despite the fact that it was a consensual relationship, and Landis upheld the conviction and sentenced Johnson to significant time in prison. This decision was largely seen as a way to dissuade interracial marriage in the United States while subsequently punishing Johnson for embarrassing former world heavyweight boxing champion James J. Jeffries, a white man, in front of a nearly all-white crowd. For Landis to uphold this ruling without even much of, of a thought is clear demonstration of his lack of support for integration in Major League Baseball. Another such action was his blocking of Bill Veek's attempted purchase of the Philadelphia Phillies in 1943. According to Veek, he told Landis of his intentions to buy the Phillies and stock it with the best talent the Negro Leagues had to offer, to which Landis reacted with shock. With this information, Landis proceeded to sell the Phillies to the next highest bid, who offered less than half of Veek's proposal. In June 1942, Dodgers manager Leo DeRocher stated in an interview with the Daily Worker that there were several Negroes he would love to have on his team if there were no rules prohibiting it. In response to this, Landis made the following statement, quote, Negroes are not barred from organized baseball by the commissioner and never have been during the 21 years I have served. There is no rule in organized baseball prohibiting their participation and never has been to my knowledge. However, there was a significant disconnect between what Landis said and how he acted. Although efforts were made to persuade Landis into allowing players of color into the league by team managers such as Branch Rickey and Leo DeRocher, no concrete steps could be taken to desegregate baseball until after Landis' death. On November 25, 1944, Kennesaw Mountain Landis died. It was shortly following his death that real strides were made in the desegregation of the major leagues. The death of the iconic Commissioner Landis opened doors for managers and players alike looking to add players of color into the league. According to Ricky, he only dared to sign Robinson in 1945 because Landis, quote, who had done more than any other to perpetuate baseball's color line, had died. It was soon after, in 1945, when Ricky decided to create his very own version of the Negro League in order to officially scout new talent for the Dodger organization. After time of scouting, Ricky became intrigued by one Jackie Robinson on the Kansas City Monarchs. Ricky had Robinson play in the minor leagues with the Montreal Royals for a year in 1946 to try and prove that desegregated teams could be successful. Here, Robinson won the Minor League World Series and found himself as the league's batting champion. Ricky knew that Robinson would face racism and discrimination, and made it very clear in their momentous first meeting that he anticipated wide-scale resistance both inside and outside baseball to opening its doors to players of color, and said he needed someone with the mental toughness not to fight back. Well, there was a lot of resistance um, and it was not an easy thing to bring 
a, a, a black player onto a team. Um, but he did not want um, Jackie Robinson to um, fight the negativity. He wanted him to just play along with it. And uh, not play along with the negativity, but just not to make, uh, not to make waves, basically. Right. Though Landis was seen as a key proponent in cleaning up the, ma the major leagues and reviving the MLB, he can also be seen as the last obstacle standing in the way of integration of the major leagues. Soon after his death in 1945, the second ever baseball commissioner was appointed with 47-year-old Happy Chandler. Chandler had a different approach to the issue and felt that he had a moral obligation to desegregate the major leagues. This is seen with his relationship with Branch Rickey. Though the 15 Dodger owners said no to the signing of Robinson, Chandler personally overruled these objections to allow Robinson to play. The way in which desegregation was able to proceed as a result of Landis' absence and the appointment of a pro-integration happy Chandler shows the defeat of Landis' old-fashioned prejudices. But I know that Branch Rickey was the manager and that he had a goal, really, to um, bring diversity to the team. And it wasn't Jackie Robinson made his major league debut on April 15, 1947. Integration was met with a lot of conflict, as there were still many whites opposed to people of color playing in professional baseball and sports as a whole. Many of the first colored athletes were subject to harsh racial treatment from these people. Threats, Racial slurs and other forms of mistreatment were common. Athletes were also subject to the separate but equal policies of the era, such as different hotels, restaurants, bathrooms, and drinking fountains. However, Jackie Robinson's debut meant a lot more than just that. The Dodgers were very successful with Robinson as a team and for Robinson as an individual. He won Rookie of the Year, Most Valuable Player once, and was a six-time All-Star, and the team won the World Series in 1955. This helped to prove to America that non-whites could be a contributing part of successful teams in professional sports. It was also a huge step for people of color in their quest to gain equality in America. This breaking of the color barrier paved the way for not just African Americans, but also Hispanics, with Roberto Clemente as the first Hispanic star. He debuted in 1955 for the Pittsburgh Pirates, and was named an All-Star and Gold Gulf winner 12 times, most valuable player once, and won two World Series over his 18-year career. Clemente was signed by Branch Rickey, the same general manager that signed Jackie Robinson about 10 years earlier. This further showed the success people of color could have in professional sports. By the mid-1950s, over 10% of Major League Baseball players were people of color. By 1951, 20% of National League quote-unquote star players were non-whites. This really showed that a star athlete could be of any race. Within 12 years, all Major League Baseball teams were integrated, as Boston was the last team to integrate in 1959. In 1950, the first black NBA players made their debuts. Chuck Cooper for the Boston Celtics and Nat Sweetwater Clifton for the New York Knicks. The Major League Baseball color barrier being broken opened the door for the integration of other professional sports as well. Today, initiatives like Stand Up to Cancer, reviving baseball in inner cities, and breaking barriers have a positive impact on the world. Specifically Breaking Barriers, which is a baseball-themed character education program developed by Major League Baseball and Scholastic Incorporated using America's sport, baseball, as a metaphor for life. The curriculum is based on the values demonstrated by barrier breaker Jackie Robinson. Determination, commitment, persistence, integrity, justice, courage, teamwork, citizenship, and excellence. Breaking Barriers has reached more than 27 million youths and 3.6 million educators in the United States, Canada, and Puerto Rico. Using baseball-themed activities, the program is designed to give children in ages 4 through 9 strategies to deal with barriers and challenges in their lives. This program, which has made a direct impact on the lives of millions, is based off of the breaking of the Major League Baseball color barrier.